Why do I use lasers, endoscope, image guidance? Why is Tri-City advertising robots? It's not any one thing, but I would just kind of liken it back to other fields that are highly technical, like surgery. Like surgery. So if I was a fighter pilot, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, that's what it would look like in a cockpit. I'd be looking out a window and having a few analog dials, but like using my eyeballs to find the enemy and shoot the enemy down. Today, you have a hybrid. You have computerized navigation, you have image guidance, you have uh, augmented reality. So, so, sort of like when we drive in our car. I'm driving, I look at navigation, I look at the road, nav, road, and sometimes my text, and then the, right? You're not just sitting there just driving. Uh, same thing if you're a race car driver 50 years ago, that's probably what, it's probably not a race car, but it's simple, very mechanical. I don't know what kind of cars you have, but if anybody has a Tesla in this room, um, I'm totally jealous. But two, that car is something. It's not like mechanical. It's like your phone. And just imagine a car that is smart. And in fact, what we call Apex automobiles, the cars that sell for like $5 million, they're a combination of electric and motor. And everything is computerized so that you have anti-lock brakes, you have independent traction, independent suspension, a variety of different things that make you better and better and better. So, this is fine, like, kind of today still. This is the last five to 15 years, instead of one big midline incision, many open incisions, that's an MI Steva. And then this is today for the next five to 10 years, percutaneous endoscopic. So we're trying to find more ways to do things percutaneously. Um, because it just makes sense. And if you look at the literature, of which there's tons, I specifically didn't bring out a lot of literature because every time someone does that, they literally fall asleep. But there's at least three, if not four, meta-analyses of endoscopic surgery. Um, there's focus issues in entire journals. Problem is the learning curve. But you know, if you do instrumentation, it's kind of like this now. Everything is freehand, you're just like, no power steering, no power windows, no anti-lock brakes. You're just mono or mono. That's today the robot, very powerful, single action activity. So if you combine that with intraoperative navigation, and it drives navigation, navigation drives robotics. That's the big deal about robotics right now. It only has the ability to hold things really still, but when you have a robot, you don't have just two arms and 10 fingers. You can give that robot 10 arms and 100 fingers if you want. And I can imagine a surgery where it's like being in an apex car. I'm still operating, but I have a ton of technology around me to be able to control instruments and be really, really precise. To do that, you can't just use like a burr on an air drill. You have to have wires going to computers that help you do things. So if you just kind of look at minimal basic spine surgery, I would say that, um, I didn't show you the literature, but there's so much literature, it's safe and effective. You just have to get through the learning curve. We'll talk about that in a second. It has tons of advantages. Less blood transfusions, faster recovery and shorter hospital stay. You hardly ever go to a skilled nursing facility. And probably for me, because I'm kind of a germaphobe and an OCD type of person, you hardly ever get infections because you don't have a big stagnant pond in the middle of the back with dead muscle tissue around it. Everything collapses down, there's very little dead space, and the surrounding tissues tend to be healthy. You have blood vessels that bring in all those fancy blood cells that fight infection, etc. So the infection rate is probably at least tenfold lower, open versus MIS. So if there's one reason I say, that's infections, because when I get an infection, I feel really dirty, I can't help myself. It seems like it's my fault. And this is kind of selfish, but it's kind of the future. I don't like rounding in hospitals that much. It takes away from my like daily practice and I could be doing other things. So the fact that patients don't stay in the hospital very long, or even better, like, have you ever seen an ortho sports guy? Have you noticed how happy the ortho sports guys are? Because they do all their surgeries in an ambulatory surgery center. They never have to round. They're so happy. I want to be like an ortho sports guy during the twilight years of my career, because let's face it, I'm getting kind of tired. Can't do these 10 hour surgeries anymore like I did when I was at UCSD. And it's better for patients. No patient wants to do a 10 hour surgery. 
we should be treating patients a little bit earlier in the spectrum, identifying diseases before they get to the point where we have to practically bring them to death's door. Um, and part of that is doing surgeries in settings where um, it's more efficient, much more focused on customer service, experience, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're wondering, okay, we have tons of really great spine surgeons in San Diego, how come not everybody's doing it? Because you have a bunch of already really, really good spine surgeons in San Diego, and they don't really need to change because the learning curve is very, very difficult. It would be like, I'm not a big golfer, but it would be like playing cavity back irons and deciding I'm gonna play blades. Anybody play golf? Any? Who plays blades? I know you all play golf. Who plays blades? Who plays cavity backs? Okay, somebody has to raise their hand. I wanna know if there's a, a blade player. That's the difference. But if you were all professional golfers, blades, no one pays cavity backs because once you climb the learning curve, you're good. But that learning curve can be very difficult. So if you are a well-established surgeon with a well-established practice, and hell, I don't need to change anything, I'm good. In other words, if I was trained as an open surgeon, I, I, I was trained as an open surgeon, but if I stayed an open surgeon today, I'm 18 years of practice, I have a pretty good practice. Somebody were to come and tell me to do all this stuff, I'd be like, what? There's no way I'm gonna to try to figure that out right now. I'm just point in my career. That's the big problem. Second big problem is the way we are kind of trained. It's sort of like we had all our training in you know, medical school and residency, and after that, in fellowship, after that, you don't need to teach me anymore. I'm all I'm all top down. <laughs> can learn no more, don't want to learn more, I'm the expert. I'm just as good as Chol Kemp's 18 years in practice. But that's not realistic, is it? So it's really, really difficult to try to step out of your comfort zone and go through a period of time where you're gonna have trouble in one form or another. So you can just imagine, wow, how are we gonna solve that problem? That's the easiest problem to solve. That's a learning curve problem. That is just a, I gotta sit down and figure out what it is about this technique that's difficult to learn, focus down on it, and it will be different for everybody. When I give this talk, I can put up hundreds of citations for how to do an MI Steve, two citations for the learning curve. I have to write a review paper, that's how I know this. It's crazy how little time you spend on things like the learning curve. But think about it, shoulder arthroscopy, I suspect a bunch of you have had shoulder surgery, rotator cuff surgery, Fast forward five years from now. Any person that's in the know that has a rotator cuff problem is gonna go to somebody that does it arthroscopically. Who would go to do somebody open? No, it tends to occur not in the universities, it tends to occur in the private practice setting for some reason, most of the time. And the university settings and the academic practices, they jump on once they know it works, and then they do a randomized controlled trial. Every randomized controlled trial that's come out of you know, orthopedic surgery, the vast majority of them come out after everyone's been doing arthroscopic ACL reconstruction and after arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. So having said that, um, the other reason to do it is if you're a spine patient, right or wrong, you think that spine surgery does not work. Now, if that was true, I wouldn't really have a practice, but you're right, you can hurt some people if you're not paying attention. So patients are very tuned to trying to get the surgery different than everybody else has. That's why Tri-City is doing so well with their robotic marketing program, um, because there's a very intense patient demand. I take care of a lot of physicians, their family members, a lot of nurses, a lot of people that are in the medical profession, because if you're in the know, you're gonna look for something slightly better than what's out there. Um, and for me, if the patients aren't doing well, I'm not doing well. I'm not, I don't, I'm not like, I don't say that because I'm just a great person. I was just unfortunately born like that. It's a sickness. I torture all my staff accordingly, but um, I have to do surgeries that the patients do well, and otherwise I can't see them. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. You know,